Today on The Grave Talks, The Bell Witch Cave, we continue our conversation with Candy Wooten. It's been called one of America's greatest ghost stories and one of the most haunted places in the U.S., The Bell Witch Cave. If you haven't listened to part one of our conversation, make sure to do that, and you can learn more about the history of the Bell Witch Cave. And today, we're going to continue that conversation. I'm Carol Hughes, and for Tony Bruski, and today on The Grave Talks, it's the second part of our conversation with Candy Wooten, Director of Operations at the Bell Witch Cave. And Candy, there is so much interesting and lengthy history that goes with the Bell Witch Cave and the property, and we discussed that yesterday. And John Bell originally owned the property, and he has a very interesting, mysterious, supernatural death. Yes. um, This is the only known case of the supernatural to have ever killed a person. Um, When the hauntings were happening, and this thing began to talk, a lot of people asked, who it was and why it was here. It always gave two reasons for being here. Uh, One was to kill John Bell. The other was to stop his youngest daughter, Betsy, or Elizabeth, from getting married to a neighbor boy named Joshua Gardner. Uh, Joshua and Betsy uh, had been engaged, and the spirit terrorized them so much that she finally broke off the engagement. But in 1820, John Bell became sick, and he was in a kind of like a comatose state. They called it a stupor, and they went to go get his medicine, and instead of his medicine, there was a small vial of dark liquid, and the spirit said that that was her medicine for old Jack, which was what she called him, and she said, I gave him a big dose of it last night, which fixed him. Um, They tested it on a cat. The cat died within a few minutes. And the next day, December 20th, 1820, John Bell died. So um, when you talk about the spirit and she talked, it almost sounds like a person, the way she communicated. She almost was, even though I don't think she was ever connected with a person. They heard the voice of the spirit just around them. Um, Like I said, she could talk so loud she could be heard in every room of the house. She attended the church, um, had long, lengthy conversations with people. As at first, it was just a whisper, but as it gained strength, it could. It carried on conversations for long periods of time and even made predictions. Now, was there anybody at that time, like um, in my family, my great-grandmother kept a diary. And in her diary, she hated um, Wild Bill Hickok. He, oh, excuse me, Buffalo Bill. She hated Buffalo Bill. And because he was friends with my grandfather, my grandfather owed, owned a training post. So it's really interesting to read back through her diaries and how much she hated him because they get drunk whenever they get together. I'm curious in this case, you know, because people did document things by writing. We didn't have video. We didn't have audio recordings. Are there written documentations of this spirit? Is that how um, you are aware of all these stories? Well, <laughs> Yes, but the diary written by John Bell and Lucy had a son named Richard Williams Bell. He wrote a diary, but he wrote it as an adult, and he was just a child when the hauntings happened, but he remembered everything very, very well. Um, He wrote the diary in 1846, um, and we give quotes from his diary on our cabin tour just to show how bad it was Um, because he talks about his hair being pulled and being pulled up out of the bed at night by his hair and um, the effect that it had on his life. Uh, He talks about that in, in his diary. His diary is called our family trouble. Um, And it had a very significant impact on his life. I mean, for the rest of his life. 
Now, this had to have been a really powerful spirit to be able to talk like that. And like in poor John Bell's case, actually kill him. Yes, with- she was very, very physical towards John Bell. She would jerk the tobacco out of his mouth um, to pull his shoes off his feet while he was walking. Um, and hit him and curse him and would all she was all time um cur- full of curses and threats with him. She really did not like him. Does she seem and to not poor- like men more than women? Well, the other the other one that was tormented the most was Betsy. Okay. Um she, she had probably the worst of the abuse from the spirit. However, on the other hand, it really liked John Bell Jr. And um, it really, it never done anything to Lucy. But then again, I kind of feel like terrorizing your child is enough to get to any mother. Absolutely. And I'm thinking too, you know, a lot of times uh, properties haunted, houses haunted, but this goes this spirit goes all the way over to the church, which is still standing on the property. It's not on the property. It's, but it's just close. A few mi- uh, maybe a mile and a half from the, from the farm, but Red River Baptist church in Adams, uh, it still stands. And that's where uh, the witch would attend on occasion. Now there was another church in Clarksville, uh, Tennessee, uh, right outside of Fort Campbell. And it has a historical marker in front of it that talks about the bell witch attending that church and quoting the sermon verbatim in the preacher's voice. And That's she, creepy. this was done, yeah, at the bell house. And when she quoted the sermon word for word in the preacher's voice, the other preacher was like, So you didn't hear my sermon? And then she quoted that one word for word in his voice. And they both happened at the same time. It's interesting to me because there are lots of people who had experiences. It's not just one family that, you know, maybe there's some psychosis or something. You might be able to debunk that. But there's documents, documented accounts of this happening to other people at other locations. Yes. Um there is one story about a man from England in the books um, that he came there to, to witness this, the haunting. And while he was there, the witch said something to the effect of, I wonder what your mom would think of me. And then she left and then they heard her again. And she said, your mom said to never send anything like me back to her house again. And the mother lived in England. Well, the man left and evidence supposedly wrote a letter back later saying that the spirit did go to his mother's house. But she was there and back within minutes. And she even told the Bell family that time and space was of no importance to her. So it was almost like she could she could read people's minds, quote scripture from the Bible, be in two places at once, um, travel from here to England and be back within minutes. <laughs> now, at some point Sorry. along the way, then did she quit being that communicative? Um, because you don't really have any issues today of her talking like that. Or do right. you? No, not like what the Bell family had. I mean, we we hear strange noises and stuff, but after she killed John Bell in 1820, she stayed around until 1821, and that's when Betsy uh, finally broke off her engagement with Joshua. And then she told everybody goodbye. She said, I'm leaving, but I will be back in seven years. Well, seven years later, she came back, but this time to John Bell Jr.'s house. She made, she stayed with him for two weeks and she was very serious to where before she was kind of like a prankster and a practical joker. But when she come back, she was on a serious note and made predictions to him for two weeks. Then after that two weeks, she left. 
So what kind of predictions? Did he write those down, I'm assuming? or He gave the information to his son. And his son's name was Joel T. Bell. And that, those predictions ended up being in only one book, which I, in some ways I kind of feel was the most important part. It was almost like, well, now that I got your attention, you know what I can do. I need you to listen to me. And she said that these predictions were for, for succeeding generations. It was a message to all of us. Now, she did predict the Civil War, um, both of the World Wars. She talks about the end of time and lost civilizations, um, how the earth eventually was going to be destroyed, how food and water at one point is going to be a problem to get a hold of. Um, but she said all of this boils down to and any civilization, she said she has seen civilizations that were, of course, we're talking about, she said this in 1828, far greater than ours that had failed because they were not followers of Jesus Christ. And she said if the Roman Empire would have been a follower of Jesus Christ up to the date of their decline, they would not have fallen. But Without Jesus, people get so mean and cruel to one another that the rich only care for the rich. The poor are starving and basically nobody has love for one another and that God will cause it to come to an end at that point. Oh, now that's fascinating. So after she came back seven years later, she gave these predictions Two weeks go by, she shares this information, and then disappears again? She said she was leaving, and according to that, she said she was going to be back in 107 years. But my take on that, which was supposed to be 1935, she said this is going to be at a time when the whole world is going to be at a great unrest. And, of course, it was. Mm -hmm. Um. But I kind of was under the assumption when reading it, it's almost like I'm returning here to Earth, not so much as the Bell Farm. That's kind of what I I get out of it. So uh, knowing all of this history, and maybe your parents didn't know all of that history when they bought the property, but there's some rich history here. They still went ahead and bought the property. Did yes. you, and at the time, you were how old when they bought it, if I may ask? I was 12 years old. So you're 12, and you probably don't know a ton about the property when you moved there. I'm going to guess, because that would have been really scary at 12. Did you, well, um, did you, were you able to figure out this isn't right, kind of right off the bat? <laughs> yes, <laughs> It didn't take long, um, but we we were originally from Madison, Tennessee, and growing up, kind of like Bloody Mary, and you know, my bro- older brother and sister, we're gonna send the Bell Witch after you. you no, know, we had heard about the Bell Witch, but we really didn't know that much about it. So I had heard of Bell Witch. It was just a scary thing to me when I was young. But then moving to the farm, it was the first night that we stayed there. I was like thinking, like, Mom, are you gonna sleep in here with me? And <laughs> right, she she was like, well, just keep the cat in there with you. And I'm like, what's the cat gonna do? <laughs> the cat's it was not gonna help me. Scary. Yeah, it was scary to to stay there the first few nights. But then it just got to the point to where it was, oh wow, I got this whole farm to explore all to myself, you know, and. And then it, it didn't, it was probably within the first week that my first experience happened and things happened ever since. <laughs> Do you think it could be the original spirit that was so talkative? Um, maybe she's gone and there are other spirits there on the property. Cause we, in the last, in part one of our conversation, we talk about the history between the trail of tears and the civil war and tobacco wars and all of these events that happened on that property, you have to think that 
some of that could have stayed on, that energy could have stayed on the property. If the spirit of the Bell Witch is still there now, she is awful quiet. <laughs> but there is there is a lot of strange things that happen there. Um, my, my parents' house has a lot of activity. Uh, my mom is, <laughs> she is now hard of hearing. And I can be over there at night and be talking to her. And I'm sitting there thinking something is in her kitchen. Like, I hear all kinds of noise in her kitchen. I'm like, Mom, can you not hear that? And she's like, hear what? <laughs> I'm like, oh, goodness. But sometimes she'll call me and so something really weird just happened. And for her to hear it, it has to be really loud. And so sometimes she'll hear stuff and you know that it has to be loud for her to hear it. Which might be kind of a blessing for her to be hard of hearing at this point and live in a house <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. What are some of the but things that happened to you and your family when you lived there? Um. Oh, gosh, you name it. We've left tape recorders in the cave and gotten strange things on those. There was one time uh, me and my mom had been gone. And when we came home, we walked into the, the upstairs of the house. and No, we walked into the downstairs. We were in the basement. And we were unloading some stuff down there. And we could hear somebody walking around upstairs. And it was, at that time, it was just me and my mom that was there. My dad was at work. And we got scared. And we grabbed some weapons. <laughs> And drove around over the hill and was just watching the house to see if anybody ran out. And then walked over the hill with these weapons and the dog and unlocked the side door and went all through the house. The house was locked. Nobody was in there. During the ice storm, uh, something similar happened. Uh, from 93 to 94, the first year we were there, there was a bad ice storm in the area. And in the middle of the night, my parents were woke up by a loud, loud noise in the basement. And my dad thought somebody's taking advantage of the, all the power being off. So he got a gun and went down into the basement and nothing was out of place. Nothing he fell over. The door was locked. Nobody was there. Uh, so there has been a lot of things like that happen. Sometimes it's just strange noises in the other room um in the cave though um noises voices we've heard noises so loud that we me and my mom have ran out of the cave um we've had people scratched touched um which as much as i hate to say this has been even more predominant in the last year i've i had two different people come out with marks on them Ooh. In this last tour season. When that happens, that would be a weird feeling because it's like they went in there voluntarily. You're given a tour. They kind of know what they're walking into. But then when they come out injured, it would be like, do they have to sign a disclaimer just in case? You know, this isn't my fault. Well, you agreed to do this. <laughs> right. Everybody sounds a waiver because the cave is not like paved walkways and right. handrails. Um, but it does cover dangers, both known and unknown, associated with touring the Belwich Cave. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. But the the people that were bothered this year was a twelve year old boy uh, that with autism and Asperger's, and a teenage girl had scratches. And then two of my new tour guys that I hired for this year were Push, which I'm sure you've seen those videos on YouTube. Uh -huh. um, it shook the the boy up. Uh, the, the my male tour guide Cooper he uh, he ran all the way up from the cave. <laughs> um, but it it does seem to be a little bit more uh, aggressive in the last year. I don't I don't know why. Now. I'm assuming you've had some investigators come out over the years or have you had some paranormal investigators? And if so, did they find anything or do they have any insight? 
Ghost uh, Ghost Adventures came in 2017, and they they got a lot of activity and different things. Um, Sam and Kobe, their YouTube, they have a YouTube video um, or YouTube channel. Um, they're pretty popular with younger kids. They came in September, which that aired in October of this last year. They picked up quite a bit. In the staff? As far, we, I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying that, that past that, there hasn't, there hasn't been a whole lot of um, invest, in, investigators come. Which might change soon, but we'll see. <laughs> well, keep me posted. Um, and the staff has had, as you mentioned, the staff's had experiences. You've got a YouTube channel, and I was watching some of them, like, getting pushed. Or There was one, too, um, that I watched where it, maybe it's the, the um, cabin that you have on the property now. Is that also a gift shop? Uh, the it, cabin we, we do tours of. That's where we tell the story. Because I saw um, someplace with books, and and you'd been closed for a couple of days, came back in, and books were on the ground that weren't on the ground when you closed. Because you would have picked up the books, or you're locking the door, you're leaving for a couple of days. Right. That was in our gift shop. Okay. Um, that that happened a lot throughout the winter before we opened uh, because they, my parents had been closed for two years because of COVID and everything was just kind of left in the gift shop. Well, when we go out there in the winter before we open <laughs> this last year and there would be a pile of books on the floor and it wouldn't be underneath the shelf where they were. They would be, a couple feet out from the shelf. <laughs> like I could see some of them bouncing out there, but not a whole stack of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was, that happened more than once, but yeah, the YouTube video, that was my daughter. She, we went in there to open up that day and I was like, there is books across the room underneath a bench. Like that shouldn't, <laughs> That shouldn't happen. It wasn't there yesterday. Right. <laughs> and of course, at that time, we didn't have the books out, out to where the public could just get a hold of them. But I mean, even still, us cleaning up the gift shop, we were closed for a few days and then we come back in there. Nobody's been in there. It's been locked up and there's books on the floor across the room. It was just like, OK, that's weird. It's, Almost makes yeah. me want to put a camera in there. <laughs> Let's see how that happens. And you are, you're not open for tours now because um, during parts of the year, because it's a cave, the cave will flood. And so you have to wait for the groundwater to recede. Mm -hmm. When are you normally open for tours then? Dep obviously, depending on weather. Um, yes, everything is weather permitting. And I suggest anybody that wants to go to the cave always call first um but we're our plans is to open back up in may on weekends um and then starting in june we would open five days a week um but i do know that a lot of times in may even being open on weekends it's <laughs> we get a lot of rain uh, it just seems to be rainy that time of year, and we'll we'll flood the cave very easily in May. But you also have the option of scheduling a nighttime tour. Eh, I don't um, know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, the cave is no different than the day. I guess it it's pretty night. dark in there, right? <laughs> Other than maybe uh, bat more bats flying around, but. Our nighttime tours or our lantern tours, whatever you want to call them, uh, you kind of, there. we have a one tour, it's a three-hour tour, and you go to the cave, the cabin, the Indian burial ground, and the haunted dale, which is on the back of our farm. I think it's fascinating. And about, what are you, about 40 miles outside of Nashville? 
Yeah, well, about 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Uh, I'm not sure how many miles. <laughs> and what town is it again? Adams, Adams Tennessee. Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And they have a, you have a website so people can check it out. It's just, I think the whole thing is fascinating. If, if someone didn't listen to part one, the whole history of the property is just very, very interesting. And I'm really um, thankful that you were able to be on with us today, Candy, because this was really interesting to me. Oh, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And that wraps up our conversation with Candy Wooten. Director of Operations at the Bell Witch Cave. And make sure you listen to part one if you have not yet done that. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything is commercial free. Become a Gravekeeper. You can sign up on Apple Podcasts or you can try it for three days absolutely free. You can also go to Patreon slash, excuse me, patreon.com slash the Grave Talks and get everything there all ad free. For all of us at The Grave Talks, I'm Carol Hughes, and thanks for listening.